Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the MyHR Minute. We would like to thank you all for attending and for your continued interest in our webinar series. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. You will be receiving a follow-up email tomorrow which will include the recording, the slide deck, as well as HRCI or SHRM recertification credit for those who attend. We hope that you can join us next Wednesday for part three of our cybersecurity webinar series with Black Bottle IT. And now I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Britt Waterman, who is a senior attorney with us at MyHR Council. Hi, thanks, Dan. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about youth labor, which is a topic that's uh, very timely, um, considering uh, if you may be uh, hiring seasonal workers and looking to hire uh, employees who are on uh, a break from school, or um, if you're having challenges uh, widening or wanting to widen your hiring pool um, in this time of uh, historic, historically low unemployment, uh, many employers are turning to uh, youth labor looking to expand their hiring options. And so this is an area of law where pre-pandemic, uh, it was very rare for me to get a question from a client uh, about uh, youth labor. Um, and it's becoming much more uh, common as, uh, be, as hiring uh, becomes a little more difficult. Uh, so let's talk about the history of child labor laws. Um, so if you know anything about the history of the labor movement, uh, it started in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Um, two historic figures uh, in the labor movement, Samuel Gompers and Mother Jones uh, of the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, um, if you know the AFL-CIO labor union. Uh, so they kind of started it all and they began a campaign against child labor very early on um, that became an important issue of the labor movement in addition to things like fair wages and better working conditions. So it was a, a point very early on. Um, Francis Perkins, who was the Secretary of Labor uh, under uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, um, and she was uh, responsible for the creation of the Fair Labor Standards Act which uh, regulates wage and hour, minimum wage over time. Um, if you haven't heard my Francis Perkins trivia, um, if, and you would like to impress your friends with a little employment law trivia, um, if you wanna know where Francis Perkins, uh, the Secretary of Labor responsible for the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, appears in pop culture, if anyone has seen the movie Dirty Dancing, um, in the uh, scene where uh, Baby and Johnny are talking and having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, Baby says that she is, her real name is Frances. She is named after Frances Perkins, the first female secretary of the Department of Labor. Um, so the, this is the Department of Labor under FDR who is responsible uh, for the creation of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Little uh, lesser known fact that uh, I like <laughs> that I like to throw in there. So Francis Perkins started the idea uh, first that the federal government should stop purchasing things uh, made by child labor and those restrictions uh, on the federal government purchasing items made by child labor went into the Walsh-Healy Act, which is familiar to those if you work with federal contracts. Uh, FDR thought that uh, minimum wage and overtime might not be quite exciting enough to get the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, passed. And he thought putting child labor provisions in there with minimum wage and overtime uh, and tying it all up in a bow just made it irresistible. And that's how child labor ended up in there with minimum wage and overtime in the Fair Labor Standards Act and the whole thing uh, got passed. So what is the rule under the uh, FLSA dealing with child labor? So employers may not use oppressive child labor. Impressive uh, automatically includes any employment in mining and manufacturing. Oppressive uh, child labor includes labor that is hazardous. 
Uh, now, what is hazardous? Good question. The federal government has a list of examples of what is considered uh, hazardous, what are the no-nos for uh, youth labor, and your state uh, most likely has a list of hazardous occupations that expands on uh, the list that the federal government has. Um, so examples, if, you're, uh, if the, the federal list says no uh, industrial slicers, no bakery machinery, if you are in food service, they are serious. Your minor employee cannot touch a slicer if it plugs into the wall uh, or a mixer, if it is an industrial mixer, even for a second. No matter how well you train them or how many safeguards you think you put on the equipment, uh, that is hazardous. And hazardous is considered oppressive child labor. Oppressive child labor is any labor that is detrimental to a child's health or well being, which is where we'll get to. Um, some of the rules about the hours that uh, minors are allowed to work and the FLSA finds that employment is not oppressive when it doesn't interfere with schooling or the child's health or well-being, which again uh, uh, has to do with the limitations on the hours and days that uh, minors are allowed to work. Agricultural, agricultural employment, I know none of uh, you are uh, most likely agricultural employers. I throw this in um, because I, uh, I don't want you to confuse your rules with agricultural employment um, because youths under 12 uh, may work in a non-hazardous environment with parental consent outside of school hours. Um, youths under 12 may not work for you even with parental consent. Um, youth 16 and older can perform any employment uh, in agriculture for unlimited hours. Uh, don't, don't get confused. Um, youths uh, 17 or 16 and older are still limited to non-hazardous employment. Um, and so this is, and, and may uh, have restrictions on the hours that they are required to work depending on your state. Um, so do not confuse your rules with agricultural employment when you're looking towards, uh, looking for guidance as far as what uh, is allowed for youth labor, what is not allowed, make sure you're looking at the guidelines or asking us, uh, looking to council and asking us about non-agricultural employment. So non-agricultural employment under the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, 18 plus any job hazardous or not any hours. 16 to 17, any non-hazardous job, and that's so that's any job that's not on the list uh, can work any hours. 14 to 15, retail, food service, gas station, limited hours. Under 14, uh, they can work as an actor or performer. They can deliver newspapers or they can work for a business owned by the parent, but under 14, they're not going to be able uh, to work for you. Um, and uh, and 14 to 15, um, they're, uh, excuse me, they, uh, there are uh, hours, uh, hourly restrictions, 14 to 15, uh, no more than three hours on a school day, 18 hours in a school week, uh, no more than eight hours on a non-school day, and no more than 40 hours in a non-school week. Um, 14 and 15 year olds may only work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. except from June 1st through Labor Day, so in the summertime, when they can work until 9 p.m. State law does not preempt the FLSA. You have to go with whatever is more protective to the employee if your state has laws that differ from this. Hazardous jobs under the FLSA. So this is the uh, list that I was referring to, uh, very specific of what uh, what minors, uh, employees under 18 are not allowed to do. A motor vehicle driver and outside helper. Outside helper uh, is like the person uh, hanging off of the garbage truck who picks up the garbage can. So an outside helper is uh, is someone who is uh, standing on the outside of a motor vehicle 
uh, or uh, hanging out of the window of a motor vehicle helping to collect uh, something. Uh, it's someone who's outside the motor vehicle but is not uh, operating the motor vehicle even though they're not operating it. Uh, under 18 still not allowed to do it. Golf carts are okay as long as they are not driven on a public road or anywhere uh, cars or other motorized vehicles uh, drive. So golf carts are okay as long as they are not driven where cars are driven. So if you are a staffing employer and you send a minor uh, on an assignment, you must make sure that they know to say no if they are asked to do something on this list. If they do something on this list, you as the employer will be the one who is liable. If they are sent to an assignment and someone, a uh, supervisor uh, at the client company says, hey, take this trash out and put it in the compactor, uh, no, they can't do that. Um, if they do it uh, and, uh, and you are found out, you are going to be liable. So. Certainly the responsibility is on you, not the employee, um, but you should uh, tell your employee, hey, say no if they ask you to do this, and if they try to write you up or try to end your assignment, we've got your back. Um, you are not supposed to be doing this, and, uh, and you know we'll take care of you. So the age of majority, the age of majority is 18. In all states except Nebraska and Alabama where it is 19, uh, individuals under the age of majority are unable to sign documents that are legally binding. Now that includes consent forms for background checks and drug testing. Um, so in all states, if you have a consent form for a background check or drug testing, if the employee is under age 18, um, they, you must have the parent or guardian sign the consent form in Nebraska and Alabama if you want that consent form for a drug test or a background check to be legally binding, you do have to have the parent or guardian sign it. Um, it best practices would be to have both the applicant or employee and the parent or guardian sign this. This may not be practical. You may have 19 year olds who are out living on their own or, you know, 18 year olds in Nebraska and Alabama out living on their own, they may say, you know, I don't know where my parents are, my parents can't come in. Um, and, you know, you just have to do what you have to do, but know that unless uh, someone has reached the age of majority, it's not legally binding. State law, this is where you're going to need to know your state. Um, if you don't know your state, we here at my HR Council practice in all 50 states. And uh, if you are not a client, please uh, check out uh, myhrcouncil.com or shoot us an email at info at myhrcouncil.com. We'd be happy to uh, let you know about uh, our multi-state practice and how we can help you know your state to make sure you're compliant in the state or states where you're operating. If you are a client, please open a ticket and ask us specifically about the laws in your state uh, so that we can help you be compliant. Child labor law is not one size fits all and it doesn't stop with the Fair Labor Standards Act. The state law that's going to apply is the state in which the minor is performing the work um, and not the state in which the minor lives. If you've got a seasonal employee from out of state, for example, however, uh, the home state may, may still come into play a, a little bit, as we'll see. Alcohol and cannabis, uh, just a side note, this there are rules uh, often under state law about uh, uh, minors or even uh, employees under age 21 working where alcohol or cannabis is served uh, or sold. Uh, this is another way you should know your state. Some states have uh, exceptions. Minors can't uh, work where alcohol is served unless it is also a restaurant and the percentage of sales come from food. Um, this is just going to, again, depend on your state law, but before you hire someone in an establishment that serves alcohol, you're going to want to make sure and, and check that you know your state law. Work permits, uh, if you are hiring a, a minor, your uh, state may require a work permit. You get that from 
uh, generally from the school district, the superintendent, or the Department of Education, and you will need to keep it on file. Um, if you're hiring a minor from out of state, um, this may require some finessing. Please open a ticket if this is the case. But some, if your state requires a work permit, uh, you should know that a work permit is required. Um, and you should know what you uh, have to do to get that, and you should make sure you keep those on file. And just to sum up internships, uh, the, the Department of Labor does have a seven-factor test as to whether an internship may be paid or unpaid. Just because someone is a student does not mean uh, that they are necessarily an unpaid intern. You cannot just call someone an intern as a way uh, to keep from paying them. So there is a seven factor test. Please open a ticket if you are going to hire someone and call them an intern to determine whether, uh, so we can help you determine whether or not you need to be paying that person. Um, calling a, a minor a volunteer, a worker can't volunteer to do something that a paid worker does. They cannot displace a paid worker um, if you are having someone uh, volunteer to do uh, filing and uh, typing and, and normally you have an admin do filing and typing, uh, that worker is not a volunteer even if they're a minor, uh, they are an employee and you do need to pay them. But uh, the internship uh, test is tricky and I would not uh, call someone a paid or unpaid, a paid or unpaid intern without checking with counsel first um, before making that decision. So that sums up our time together today. I want to thank everyone for participating in the webinar. It was great to have you. Again, uh, if you have any questions, you can send us an email at uh, info at myhrcouncil.com if you are not a current client and would like to know more. If you are a current client, please open a ticket in the Ask an Attorney portal. Um, and you can always go to myhrcouncil.com for more information about uh, our packages. So thank you all for participating today. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.